Coming up on DTNS, Amazon brings back the home phone with a twist. Tile brings insurance for your lost devices, but don't call it insurance. And another bill to try to fix safe harbor in the U.S. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 9th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In the hurricane winds of Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the uh, show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, Sarah, it's good to have you back. I it's hope. good to be back. Yeah, yeah I missed everybody. Vacation. Yeah, we missed you too. Uh, we were just talking about Dune uh, and how <laughs> the Bay Area looks like Dune, but also there's a new trailer about Dune. Uh, if you want to get that wider conversation, get Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Walmart announced a pilot drone delivery service from its stores in Fayetteville, North Carolina. The drones are provided by Israeli startup Flytrex Aviation and can fly around 6.2 miles carrying packages up to 6.6 .6 pounds once they take off from a landing pad near the store. Walmart's new Walmart Plus service goes live September 15th, so maybe this will eventually be part of that. Another plus subscription to get used to. Yubico announced a version of its security key for USB-C with NFC built in. Previous NFC was only available through USB-A keys. Uh, NFC allows you to use a physical key as a second factor for devices like phones. YubiKey 5C NFC is available now and costs $55. It supports iOS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Epic Games tweeted that Apple will, quote, no longer allow users to sign in to Fortnite using Sign In with Apple as soon as September 11th, 2020, end quote, which may leave users unable to play Fortnite even if they already have it installed, and prevent them from accessing their data from the app. Epic has a new support document online to mitigate this, which walks users through updating their Epic account to their real email address and creating a password. I smell some FUD. I got, I'm interested in what Apple says about this. After we updated you on vaccines on yesterday's show, of course, news broke about vaccines. Oxford University and AstraZeneca paused its phase three trial after a UK participant fell seriously ill. Now, before you jump to conclusions, the illness is not necessarily because of the vaccine. People get ill for all kinds of reasons, but any vaccine trial stops when any participant gets ill for any reason so they can determine whether it is related to the vaccine or not. That's the whole point of the trial. Uh, if unrelated, the trial will resume in a few days, and this is the second time AstraZeneca has paused its trial. The first came earlier this summer due to some unexplained system, symptoms that were eventually determined to be unrelated to the vaccine. Bloomberg sources say Nintendo is increasing production of the Nintendo Switch by 20% after months of reduced supplies due to virus-related supply chain complications. Bloomberg says Nintendo had increased production to hit $25 million in its fiscal year, but it wasn't enough and is now targeting closer to 30 million. Bloomberg sources also indicate a 4K-capable switch might arrive in 2021. Don't get deja vu, folks. We've got more Xbox news. <laughs> we do. Microsoft announced that the flagship Xbox Series X will launch on November 10th for $499. The S launches the same day for $299. Pre-orders begin for both consoles on September 22nd. Customers can opt to buy the console through the Xbox All Access plan that also includes Xbox Game Pass, Ult Game Pass Ultimate and Xbox Live. The Series S costs $25 per month over 24 months, and the Series X costs $35 per month over 24 months. We also have clarification on storage for the Series S. Xbox Series S supports a one terabyte storage expansion card with the full speed and performance of the Xbox Velocity architecture. Previous generation Xbox titles can be played directly from an external USB 3.1 hard drive, but games optimized for Xbox Series S and Xbox Series X must be played from internal storage or the expansion card. So this was a big question this morning when Tom was on my morning show. We do a little tech question on DTNS yesterday, too. Yeah, and nobody knew. There were no confirmations. Of course, yesterday was more about, you know, leaks and unverified stuff. And today we got confirmation on pretty much everything that we heard. Um, on the storage front, it's been known for a while that at least the Series X, the high-end model, would have some sort of expandable storage system, but it would come in the form of a proprietary hard drive architecture only Microsoft would make or third parties they would approve. So this isn't as simple as you running out and buying a really high-speed USB-C Thunderbolt drive and plugging it into the back of your, 
device like you used to be able to do, although, as stated here, 3.1 USB will still work with old hard drives running old Xbox One and previous games on it, just like they do today. But if you want to expand that thing, you got to buy this uh, second, the secondary device, this upgrade module. Downside of that with the S model, which is a very attractive price, either the monthly option, which actually makes it cheaper, end up paying $240 for that thing if you do the two-year plan, uh, or if you buy it for $300 outright plus the you know Xbox Ultimate stuff every month. Either way you go with that thing, that seems like an incredible value. It's the one I have my eye on um, because I think the tech drawbacks that it does have, which you guys discussed yesterday, are not deal breakers. In fact, they are really advantageous given some people's situations with whatever TV they have or whatever their needs may be. My big hang-up with that device was storage. 512 gigabyte is not a lot. That is a small amount of storage space for the kinds of games, especially AAA titles you might install on there today. And while they may be counting on a lot of people playing cloud-based games on xCloud, and we know they are, but a lot of people may do that. And There's other reasons to think that this might be enough at a bare minimum. I think people are going to want that extra storage. And so by then you're kind of spending Xbox Series X money. So I don't know. This is a this is a this is a point of uh, of of contention for me until I hear what the price of that expansion is. But otherwise these are all interesting confirmations today and things are things are getting hairy. Yeah, 499 for the for the flagship isn't bad either. 299 certainly a bargain. And like you say, if you're going to buy Xbox Game Pass Ultimate anyway, it's cheaper to get that plan and you don't have to shell out all the money at, at, at one time. So, uh, yeah, I think interesting to see that that we are getting what would have enraged gamers in the past, a, a model of Xbox without the ability to use physical media, uh, yeah. but it's being embraced as, as a very affordable, high-powered version. I mean, it, it matches the Xbox Series X in a lot of the specs. It just doesn't have the storage uh, or the display output because it's 1440p, not 4K. Yeah, and if, as somebody who doesn't buy discs at all anymore for anything, this is exactly the kind of thing I'm looking for, and I know there are a lot of gamers like me, but it'll be interesting. Sony kind of has to answer this price point, and in other news, this also came as a bit of a surprise and wasn't really part of the leak, although I'd heard rumors previous to this. Microsoft Game Pass service... We'll have more games soon as EA announced its subscription service, EA Play, will now be rolled into your Game Pass subscription for no extra cost. So this is a long-time strategy of EA's. They've had it there forever. Uh, normally it's 5 bucks, and now you're going to roll that right into your price, and you're, bam, you're there. I don't know what deal they struck with this, but it's pretty interesting. EA Play costs $4.99 a month alone on consoles. Xbox Game Pass costs $4.99 a month as well. Game Pass Ultimate, which includes Xbox Live, and xCloud streaming is $14.99 a month. I should also throw in there that includes Game Pass on PC for that total price. Uh, PC is also separate for 5 bucks. Anyway, Game Pass Ultimate subscribers will also be able to stream, not just download, some of EA's games. So strange days, man. EA, it feels like EA basically over the last few months, and then this is sort of the pinnacle of this, has been pulling away from their strategy, which was, we have services. We have subscriptions. Come be part of Origin on PC and on consoles. Get EA, EA Game Pass or uh, whatever they call it. EA Play, rather. EA Pass. Uh, come do all that with us, and we'll take your money. And what's happened over time is they've realized, well, by not keeping their games on Steam and the PC uh, environment and by not being as, uh, I don't know, effective at getting people interested in their EA Play service independently, why not roll in with the big boy and make uh, kind of an effort together? I think this is actually kind of huge, and it's a huge new value. So add on top of that previous story we just talked about, those confirmed prices, $299 or $240 if you do the monthly for that device, plus Game Pass uh, Ultimate, and you're getting EA Play thrown in there, that may be the ultimate in-game service pricing that anyone's ever seen ever. So this is a huge deal for them. I realize that, you know... Sony's got plans. They've got guns. They've got stuff in their arsenal, mostly in the form of really amazing first-party titles. But they haven't talked about anything close to this. So this has just made everything heat up for me, and I could not be more excited to see what Sony's response is to this. Do you, okay. feel, yeah. like, do you feel like 15 bucks per month is fair? Because that seems high to me, Oh no, even, it, even for what you're saying. I think it's way fair because the $15 a month one, the Game Pass Ultimate, gets you... Everything on the on the Xbox, all of those games, you just play them. You don't have to pay $59.99 for them. You just play those games. They're, they're there for the taking, including the DLC and all of that. 
They sync all the saves through cloud gaming, through playing right off the drive itself, synchronized to your PC, so your PC is also going to play all those games, and those games are synchronized across the platform. All of that for 15 bucks. People pay 15 bucks a month just to play World of Warcraft. So that gives you a good comparison. Like one video game subscription service yeah. is around 15. This will give you all those. But if all you want is one corner of these, you get in for five bucks. Like right now, I don't have an Xbox One. I play a lot of Xbox Game Pass, and that's only five bucks a month. So I play that on my PC, and I get access to everything that comes out. Gears 5, brand new when it came out. Hit that service the same time it hit consoles, the same time it hit Steam, and I'm off playing it for my measly five bucks. Plus a lot of third-party stuff. Like, it is the number one value right now, and they've given tiers of it so that people don't have to go all in if they don't want to. Um, if you're going to do that, like Tom said earlier, all of this adds up to be a really great value if you were already in on the Game Pass. And now a bunch of EA stuff. Yeah, and now EA stuff, too. Your move, Sony. Uh, CyberScoop reports on a part of U.S. Operation Warp Speed. Uh, that's the program for producing coronavirus vaccines. This report, however, is on a part of that operation called Security and Assurance. Security and Assurance is made up of people from the NSA, FBI, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, all working together to help protect government agencies and pharmaceutical companies who are working on the development or manufacture of a vaccine for COVID-19. The team has already helped defend against attempts to steal intellectual property, which seems to be the biggest threat right now, but is also preparing defenses against attempts to manipulate or delete vaccine trial data as well. That'd be a little more sabotage than just stealing. Uh, the program's also concerned about the possibility of attackers interfering with or causing production of a harmful product uh, once manufacturing starts. They're not expecting that, but they're prepared just in case. It's not impossible. Department of Defense hosts daily meetings to monitor real-time efforts, keep everybody informed. Uh, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA personnel, help with incident response at companies. So they're, they're getting a little expertise help. This includes proactively scanning internet-connected devices, stuff like that. When incidents are detected, the Department of Homeland Security shares technical indicators to companies throughout the system to boost collective defense. So if Moderna has an event, they share what they learned with AstraZeneca or anybody else. The effort has caused a shift in the conception of health security amongst these pharmaceutical companies from being solely about patient privacy, which is usually what they're concerned with, to also being about nation state threats, advanced persistent threats. After a vaccine is approved, the program will help defend against activities meant to erode public confidence in it. So even once the vaccine is out there and manufactured, uh, they're going to keep this going. I thought it was a really interesting description of the government stepping in and in cooperation with private enterprise, providing uh, a lot of expertise on cybersecurity and defense. And, and they have some successes under their belt so far. Of course, we'll see. But um, it's the kind of thing you, you might maybe see as a template for finance or, or other industries. My big takeaway is that uh, I like this kind of transparency. So I hate to say the phrase, but now more than ever, we could use this kind of thing. And I'd love it. So I, for one, I don't, you know, I don't have a ton of expertise in the area, obviously. But hearing you describe this kind of stuff makes me feel better about the process than I did before. And before I felt like, I don't know what's going on. Maybe it'll work. Who knows who's doing what? Eh, that feels better than that. So <laughs> I guess thanks. Yeah. Yeah. When I, when I hear stuff about, you know, manipulating, deleting vaccine trial data, creating a harmful product, I'm like, what, who's doing that? Well, you know, if you, if you have enough of these people who are, um, who, who, who do their job well and enough of these government administrations together, hopefully we will eradicate that or at least, you know, diminish it wholly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is this is nation state level stuff. So you need nation state level expertise. Right. Exactly. Well, moving on to something that might uh, surprise and delight a few AT&T customers. Amazon has partnered with the AT&T to let customers link their phone number to an A assistant Amazon Assistant account to receive phone calls on Amazon devices. So the voice assistant can already call out to phone numbers at no charge. Customers at Vodafone, one number in Germany and the UK, as well as the UK's EE, already have the ability to receive calls this way. Not new, already happening. Customers 
uh, AT&T customers rather can link their phone number in the settings of the Alexa app. Yeah, uh, well, EE and, and Vodafone uh, customers who have this too. Uh, it's it's cool because I, I I think I forgot that I could actually send calls out uh, the already, like I can, I can call my mom from the echo. I never do, but I could, uh, but now she can call me back. Uh, I could, I could set this up if I had AT&T, which I don't, but, but if I did, I could set this up and have her call me and I could answer it with, I wouldn't have to go pick up my, my cell phone. I could just, uh, I could just have my echo pick it up. So at first I was excited about this, like, Oh, this is like the modern version of the home phone. It's finally back in a way that might appeal to, to people who may have grown up without a, a home landline situation with just mobile phones. But then, Sarah, you pointed out, like, who's going to want to have their conversation, like, out in the open in front of everybody? <laughs> right. And and some people would be like, well, it depends on who you call, right? And it totally does. For me, I mean, I live alone. It wouldn't matter. But, I, you know, hearkening back to the days where, you know, I lived with my parents and, you know, privacy was, was uh, you know, oh, yeah, a, a most important, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, you're not going to talk on the phone to a friend on a, uh, you know, a smart speaker in your house, period, unless you have to. Yeah. But it is a cool, it's a cool feature. And I would be curious to know for anyone who's like, well, I don't live alone, but here's why this actually works for me, how, you know, how, how that works for them. Yeah, it's just basically the coming back of a weird form of speakerphone that you can control with your voice. And in some ways, that's super cool and way cooler than the old phones we used to have in the house. But as someone who hasn't had a house phone in a long time, my temptation, honestly, is to call my wife one day from my own couch in the same house while she's <laughs> in the room and just you say. You can already do that. That's just that's just a drop in. Yeah, on... but think of this. I'll do it on the speaker. She'll do it. You know, she'll dial it for me. Call. Oh, you're me gonna call her phone. Yeah, and I'll say. Well, you, you could know, already do that. This is the new thing here is receiving. It, right. Yeah, like, is, is the, the point that you need you're to going call the, the echo when she's in the kitchen from your but, cell phone but, when you're out of the house? That'll figure and, out. And the point is to confuse her because you could also oh, just be like, hey. This, this is the part I didn't get to. If I <laughs> lay on that couch and I, and I don't have to move, all I did was go, A word, call my wife. It calls her. She's in the other room. Hello. Hey, hon, bring me some beef jerky and maybe a Coke. <laughs> but you don't need the phone system to do that. No, you don't. You know, that's what I would don't, use. You don't. But, but no, then but you don't you hear don't, later, you, you know what, still... Scott? You shouldn't have yelled at me. <laughs> You still can do it with the Echo without the phone. Like, the phone thing doesn't even help you there. That's There's true. But, no but reason for yelling. That's call out now. You're right. So yeah. the, the trick would be like, safe. Well, you can use fast. drop in. If she's in the same house, you just. Well, then I'll have a rule. She has to call me back the same way. <laughs> all right. You fixed it. Yep. All done. All right. The announcement of a new, of a new premium protect level is coming from our uh, friends over there at Tile. Uh, it's a service that will reimburse, reimburse rather, users for the cost of lost items. If you're not familiar with Tile, they have a couple of imp implementations, but these like nice little plastic things. You stick to important stuff, your notebook, your tablet. They get lost. Uh, you can track them and find them. But if they get lost permanently, you're kind of out of luck. Anyway, they'll do this to up to $1,000 per year if Tile is unable to find them, uh, find their lost item within seven days. That covers tile trackers and tile enabled partner products like Skull Candy, Airbuds, and the HP Elite Dragonfly laptop. Uh, let's see. Tile already has this $30 premium plan with smart alerts to ping users when they left something behind, along with free battery replacements and extended hardware warranty and customer care. But if you want the premium protect, it is $100 a year. It's basically insurance. They're just not calling it that. Yeah, they don't want you to call it insurance. They're saying it's it's a guarantee of our network. And that's that's the thing. With the great possibility, maybe even September 15th, that Apple would announce AirTags, uh, which use Wi-Fi Direct, which has longer range, people may be looking at Tile and saying, well, it uses Bluetooth. Is it even going to be able to find my stuff? And what Tile's saying is, we have a network. Everybody who uses Tile passes along the signal securely, so 90% of the stuff you lose, we're going to find. And if you're worried about that 10%, We'll give you a guarantee if you pay us $100 a year uh, that you'll either find it or we'll cover the cost of your item. Now, there's a max on that cost, like Scott said, of $1,000. So if you lose a $1,000 item, you've run through your yearly allotment right there. Uh, I think it's funny that they're calling, they don't want to call it insurance. They're saying it's a service warranty on the network, but they're also hiring an insurance company to administrate it. So it's pretty yeah, much If they really were super, super confident in it, they would just say, hey, if anything gets lost, we'll pay for it because that's how much how confident we are in our service. 
And I wouldn't be crazy enough to do that either. So I'm glad they're not doing Most that. Most insurances shit. have a deductible or a max. So I guess that's not that big a deal. Sure, deutal. I guess I so. But and yeah, I get what you're saying. If you got something like a, I don't know, I'm trying to think something under a thousand bucks. That's like your phone. And you and you're not using any other kind of find my phone services or whatever. All right, that's not bad. You probably only lose it once a year, if that. And if you thought it was worth the thirty bucks, okay. I don't know, but personally, I would never use this. But for somebody out there, this is going to be the perfect little mini insurance thing to have on your tiles. If you've ever used Cover Genius uh, by eBay or Booking.com or Wayfair, that's the company working with Tile on this. So uh, if 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 you're wondering, like, wait, who's who's providing this insurance? It's it's a company that does this sort of insurance slash you know service guarantees uh, for a bunch of other companies out there. Hey, folks, uh, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, don't forget, you need to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Section 230 of the U.S. Communications and Decency Act lets Internet companies moderate comments without being liable for the postings they leave up. This law was enacted in 1996 to encourage companies to allow comments and moderate them because, before the act, uh, it wasn't clear whether an internet company was the publisher or a distributor, and they were often, in court cases, held liable if they tried to moderate. But if they didn't try to moderate, it turned into a cesspool really fast. So this law was meant to fix that, to say we want to encourage people to do moderation so these services are useful. Uh, we don't want them to feel like if they moderate, uh, they have to moderate everything or they're liable. Well, the uh, enthusiasm for CDA 230 has, has waned over the years. Tuesday... Uh, is the latest attempt to fix it. Three U.S. senators introduced the Online Freedom and Viewpoint Diversity Act, which would modify Section 230 to roll back the blanket protection for moderation so that platforms would only receive the protection if their moderation decisions were made based on an objectively reasonable belief that content violated a specific policy. So the standard would be an objectively reasonable belief. Someone else looking at your policy would say, yes, that reasonably violates that policy. And also, you have to have a policy and you have to violate it specifically. Some other terms in the bill uh, would be changed so that you would make moderation more specific, a change in the definition of what is platform versus what is information content provider, uh, or, or could reduce the ability of platforms to add labels for fact checking. Now, this is just the latest attempt this one may or may not catch on. Uh, there are so many versions of this out there. The original law lets companies moderate content considered obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. And a lot of folks take objection to otherwise objectionable. They think it's too vague and too broad and allows moderation of anything. So the bill replaces otherwise objectionable with promoting self-harm, promoting terrorism, or unlawful. It's not the only bill, as I mentioned, amending Section 230. There's the Eliminating Abusive and Rampant Neglect of Interactive Technologies Act that would let federal and state claims against online companies that host child exploitation content uh, go through. So that's particularly about child exploitation. There's the Bipartisan Platform Accountability and Consumer Transparency Act, which would require greater transparency around decisions. Here's the thing. The problem's generally being claimed of Section 230 are that conservative voices are being minimized or silenced by platforms, or extremist voices and sensational material is being amplified. And it's not clear that any of these bills really are going to fix that. Paul M. Barrett, the deputy director of the NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights, wrote an opinion piece for Technology Review today, and he says, lawmakers should adopt the quid pro quo approach for Section 230. He says, require platform companies to ensure that their algorithms don't skew towards extreme and unreliable material to boost user engagement. Uh, he takes that from a University of Chicago Booth School of Business recommendation from 2019, uh, saying, look, uh, if you can't show your algorithms aren't promoting unreliable material or extreme material, you lose your safe harbor. Uh, it doesn't change your moderation. It just says you're not taking advantage of it to boost objectionable stuff. Uh, they could also disclose data on content moderation methods, advertising practices, and which content is being promoted and to whom. In other words, transparency. That's the John Thune bill that I mentioned earlier. So maybe that is a good one because it says, look, uh, let's see what voices you're minimizing, what voices you're silencing, and which ones you're not. There is a bill uh, that I just mentioned, co-sponsored by Senators John Thune and Brian Schatz. Uh, Thune is of South Dakota. Senator Schatz is from Hawaii. 
It wants these companies to explain their moderation policies and provide detailed quarterly stats on things that are downranked, removed, or demonetized. Would give them 24 hours to remove court-ordered unlawful content, so that puts a time limit on it, which right now they don't have, and orders them to, if they're of a certain size, set up a complaint system with appeals for users, which Facebook is already doing. They have an independent court for people to do appeals. Knowing all of this stuff and what the two big problems are and, and what the attempts are here uh, to fix it, Scott, Sarah, what do you guys think? Oh, man. I mean, so, all right, I've said for a long time, if you came to me in 2008 and you said, Scott, would you like to have um, more or less government insight slash uh, oversight on anything that happens on the internet. And I would have said less, in fact, none, if we can do it, because we will be good stewards of this content. We will do our best and, and moderate and do well and, and, and take care of our gardens. And now we jump another 10, 12 years, and I'm not sure we've, we've lived up to that entirely. Some have, plenty have, but lots haven't so much. Um, I would argue that Facebook currently, in my opinion, is not a great steward of their moderating of their information or of their platform um, and, and having people adhere to whatever standards they hold. And, and so now it's a harder question. I still don't want government fingers in internet goings on, but I also can see uh, a bigger picture of abuse and slash um, people taking advantage of the system, gaming the system over time, that, those being users, and then the platforms not being prepared to handle that gaming of the system and that sort of thing. Um, you see them try really hard, like there's this recent horrible situation with a with a live stream suicide that was floating around social media, and it's showing up everywhere over and over and over because people, bad actors, are like, well, let's just re-upload it. Let's disguise it as another video. Let's do it again and again and again. And companies like TikTok and Facebook and everybody else scrambling to stop it from happening is a good thing, but in the end, is it enough? And I don't know now. Like, I feel kind of weirdly torn now. I want nothing but the best for a free and open internet. But at the same time, I don't feel like we've done a great job at, at, at managing it ourselves, or these companies haven't anyway. Well, I mean, when you look at the law, this, this you know, amended law that's, you know, that's, that's, that's trying to go forward, enacted in 1996 about moderation on the Internet. I mean, imagine 1996 about moderation on the Internet. Like, what are we talking, like a couple news groups? I mean, the, this is a very different world it, that we're no, living it was, in now. It, it was AOL and CompuServe, and and one of the cases immediately after Section 230 had to do with promoting the Oklahoma City bombing. So it was on a smaller scale. Definitely it's not that different. Yeah, not that different. But you know, we yes, we we have we have amplified everyone's voices in a good way and a bad way. And the you know the, I think that what at, at least as a user, what makes me frustrated over and over with a lot of the platforms that I'm active on is when, yeah, something like what you described, Scott, something like that happens, we all say, why did this happen? And the platform says, well, we're, you know, just trying to like roll with the punches and figure out things and, you know, we'll make it better in the future. If there are certain um, measures in place where it's like, this is above and beyond never going to happen or you're going to be, you know, you're going to be in trouble, I don't know that that's a bad thing. And I know that that sounds to a lot of people like, oh, too much regulation, but it it might not be. It, it, I don't think that platforms have shown us that they can do it on their own anyway. Well, and, and if you guys want to know a little more about the background, because this, this was not a new problem. In 1959, uh, there was an LA law uh, saying that uh, bookstore owners couldn't uh, sell uh, certain, you know, obscene material and a bookstore owner case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said the bookstore owner isn't liable because he didn't know it was in there. You can't be expected to know the contents of every book. That's what Section 230 is based on, is this idea like, you know, Facebook and TikTok could definitely do a better job, YouTube, et cetera, Twitter could all do a better job, but they can't possibly know everything that's being posted. So it's a matter of how do we make it so that there's less of a chance of this stuff getting out there? Uh, and I think that's what's new. And that's why we need a new law, like you say, because 1996, I mean, they, they didn't know the scale uh, at which this would operate. Oh, that's pre-everything that's a problem. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Right. All the problems were there. They just... Can we go back to 1996, please? Yeah, they were... I like problems. There were just a few people being like... I don't know. Like... I don't have to use mosaic. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> yes. 
hey, there's a weird guy who said something weird to me on the internet. Make yeah. him go away. Oh, yeah. 1996, I miss you. Hey, if you <laughs> if you also want to reminisce with us, join in the conversation in our Discord, which you can join to by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. What's in our mailbag? Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Doctor wrote in, this actually comes from our Discord, and said, DTNS is my favorite way to keep my pulse on the broad field of technology. While many tech podcasts or ch our channels focus on a particular area, like PC parts or industrial tech or medical tech, Tom and the team always give you a view of the wider world of tech news. I'm always confident that the DTNS team will do their best to deliver timely and accurate information. Oh, thank you, Doctor. That's very nice. Yeah, that's very heartwarming. Thank you so much, Doctor. We're so glad you like the show. We'll keep doing it. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Erwin Stir, Philip Shane, and Kevin? <laughs> I don't know. A few of you SNL people will get that. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Scott Johnson as well. Scott, you're a busy man. You do a lot of stuff. What would you like people to know uh, about your latest work? Well, we are in the thick of the current Geek Chronicles uh, season, season one of current Geek Chronicles, a spinoff or a spin forward, I like to call it, of current Geek. Mm. And if you are interested in what our latest is, it's called The Theremin is for Chumps. <gasps> and you might think, wait a minute, that's not for Chumps. That was the Star Trek theme and it had the theremin. Well, it did. And we talked some about that, but we go deep into some really cool stuff like alternative instruments and uh, things you have never even heard of, like Tom, uh, give me a couple examples. What was the? Oh one? man, if you want to be the cool kid at the party who's like Theremin, what about the Chapman stick? Yeah. Uh, listen to this episode. Yeah, the Chapman stick is cool. I went on a tear, and I'll share this with everybody at some point. But I made a small and growing playlist on Apple Music. It could easily be, uh, be applied to Spotify or YouTube or anything else of Chapman stick players because I kind of got hooked on the sound of that thing because of this episode. So anyway, if you have even a passing interest in electronic music or electronic instruments that are played in very non-traditional ways, from the theremin all the way to the Chapman stick and more. Go check it out. That's at currentgeek.com or Current Geek Chronicles, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, folks, there's one great way to support the show. We get to keep uh, more money from this source than any other. You get perks. You get ad-free feeds. It's called Patreon. You're like, wait. Is this, but, but I heard all these. No, Patreon. Go. It really does like pay for most of the show, 90% of the show. So uh, if you at all love Daily Tech News Show and you want to help us out, uh, by all means, please uh, join on up, even at just two bucks a month, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. And if you have feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are also live Monday through Friday. Join us if you can, 4.30 p.m., Eastern 2030 UTC for a limited time only. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>